Luke Johnson from Noetic. We're going to be doing several installments of Marcus Aurelius's Meditations. Um, and what I want to do in this particular module for the Noetic app um, is I wanted to pass the mic. I wanted to see I, a lot of everybody sort of understands the way that I teach. And I think there is a lot for me to learn from the other individuals that are involved in Noetic. And so for this particular discussion of the first three books of Meditations, uh, C.J. Eller is going to be leading us, although here Jordan and I will be flanking him in there case he needs is. any. Nope, there I am. Nope. Oh. In case there he needs is. any sort of assistance. Um, so I'm going to stop there, and I'm going to actually rein myself in and let C.J. do what C.J. does. I'm going to let him lead. All right, sure. C.J., it's yours. So we are studying Marcus Aurelius's meditations. And before I begin, I at least maybe want to give a brief context and maybe have Jordan help me out if it's okay. But Marcus Aurelius was a Roman emperor and he wrote these little meditations. We don't really know where, we don't really know when, but we know that in between, betwixt and between him being a Roman emperor, he wrote down these little aphorisms and adages and notes to himself, reminders to himself. And then they got compiled and they became the meditations. Now what's interesting is that this was not meant to be published at all. So it was in some sense a diary of sorts. And I don't even know if calling it a diary gives it enough credit, but I don't know if you want to give any elaboration on Marcus Aurelius being a Roman emperor or anything like that, or context, like what was he doing, when, or yeah, anything? Yeah, sure, I'd be happy to kind of pad in, uh, I think, Get a the history majors yeah, like, point of view here. Sure, um, I can give you like a couple of like key facts, and I'm sure, CJ, you know this, and you can jump in at any point. Uh, so his reign was from 161 uh, to 180, so pretty... Okay pretty lengthy uh, <laughs> like career span for a Roman emperor during the imperial period. He was one of the uh, good emperors. So the key uh, aspect of that is that it was like a non-hereditary line. So a lot of these emperors were pulled from the ranks of being generals and they were essentially groomed for the position. And what constitutes as a good emperor? Is that almost like a Pax Romana sort of thing? Like a as in, like, it was just a peaceful reign, or, I mean, I, of course, I know Marcus Aurelius had conquests and other things like that, but what, what constitutes as a good emperor? Was it just a good moral character, or something more than that? Um, I would say a combination of both. So, um, the, the Antonine dynasty kind of, like, was on the heels of the Flavians, which was really on the heels of the Julio-Claudians, and so, uh, the idea of the sort of, like, association of uh, debauchery and uh, was really tethered to this uh, concept of hereditary uh, rule. Mm -hmm. And uh, with the good emperors, the fact that they, uh, for the most part, you know, were more so picked because of their competency versus mm -hmm. their bloodlines made them, I guess you could say, uh, in quotes, good emperors. <sighs> and his predecessor, um, Antonius Pius, had actually, which is remarkable was an uneventful rule so he reigned for almost like 25 years and um nobody died or yeah no it was relatively uh war? it was relatively placid i mean there were things going on around uh on like the borders of the empire but in terms of like civil war or uh you know any sort of like social upheaval it was kept to a minimum it would seem uneventful is a good thing yeah exactly that point. so in terms, of, in terms of like the <laughs> roman empire and the roman imperial period uh, no news was actually great news. Uh, so yeah, so pretty much with Antonius Pius's predecessor, uh, the harmony between the Senate and the Emperor was at its apex, and it was really the pinnacle of, uh, if I could quote uh, Mary Boatwright, uh, the it was the pinnacle of organized, benevolent, and self-assured uh, form of rule in mm. the Empire. For Marcus Aurelius's mm -hmm. reign. And what's wonderful is that we're going to explore at least what's going on in Marcus Aurelius' head during this reign, and I think meditations will give us a glimpse of what makes him a good emperor, or at least what makes it those things that you just said, a really benevolent and wonderful role by this, by this mm -hmm. man in particular. And that gets into two of the particulars, I think, which is, a, which is the school of philosophy that Marcus Aurelius 
is writing under, or at least has inclinations towards, which is Stoicism. And I, I don't know if, if you all have any impressions of Stoicism already, because, I mean, granted, when we started Existentialism, doing all that, we at least for me, it's just like, oh, there's no meaning in the world, you know, it, it all means nothing, and I have my own baggage. But I was wondering if you all had any baggage or any maybe understanding of stoicism as is because maybe i'm assuming you're not going to be alone at least maybe mm -hmm. the people listening are going to have the same idea just like oh yeah you know it's just no feeling at all and just being really placid i suppose mm -hmm. what what did you guys think of stoicism or do you have any ideas of it like what my initial impressions yeah, were yeah uh, even before so reading this yeah the, the most I ever did with existentialism was I got to teach a little bit of Epictetus the Stoic. Uh, or you mean Stoicism, yeah. What did I say? You, you said, said existentialism. Um, yeah. We're brainwashed. <laughs> yeah, we are. The most I, ever, I got to teach a little bit of Epic, Epictetus at some point. Um, and the little bit of exposure that I had to it, I, I, find it, I found it to be sort of vague and nebulous. And I would mm -hmm. say, like, what we're going to cover today in the meditations... It's like, a bit vague. It's a bit vague, but there are going to be some points of clarification that will hopefully over the course of doing four, three, four, five installments of meditations, however many it takes, I, I am confident that Marcus Aurelius is such a profound enough thinker that will have a robust conception of what Stoicism is and therefore further um, the promulgation of Stoicism amongst the modern public. And I wonder why you think it was so vague. Was it just because of the writing that you that you looked it's at, fragmentary. Fragmentary. I've, I've, I've never I've never studied it in any sort of holistic way. Mm. So this will be my closest study of, of stoicism ever. It never particularly interests me. Mm. Um, I wonder why that is. Well, the, I think I think a number of reasons that is that as as much as it is to be to me as much as it seems to be a practical life guide, um, implementing it seems to be an entirely other matter. Uh, and that's I, and that's what we're going to get into. Yeah, which is so, really wonderful. So, like, I think it's all fine and good to talk about uh, non-attachment, and I think it's all fine and good to uh, not be worried about death. I think it's all fine and good. Um, <laughs> is that actually doable? Um, I, I'm skeptical, but we'll see. I'm going to be very generous to Marcus Aurelius and see what he has to say. I approach it with an open mind. Wonderful. And Jordan, how about you? Or did, um, I mean, you you probably delved into a little more than we did maybe yeah, studying I would say um, actually I have a very soft spot for stoicism mm. and as I, I think if I could uh, I guess in like some way uh, draw a correlation uh, that Simone de Beauvoir found comfort in Hegel and I find comfort in stoicism mm. you know what's interesting to me is that like I don't know if I, and this is a theme throughout. Like, stoicism no. is not like a snuggly or cuddly no, thing, but, but, but it's something yeah. that I think that um, I would say since I, my, my teens, I've been just drawn to it. And it's just something that I've read and have just, it's, it's resonated really profoundly with me. Well, the th interesting thing to me is that, that I, it's, it feels a little bit silly to talk about stoicism as separate from the other things that we've studied. Mm -hmm. Um, because obviously I can sense some of the St. Augustine that we've done right. in this text. Mm -hmm. And when I talk about the uh, St. Augustine, um, I think there's existentialism in Augustine. Mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of the stuff, I really don't think that Simone de Beauvoir would be too different from Marcus Aurelius on this stuff. Especially in the way that she conceives of how we ought to comport our lives like, you know, in, in daily sort of existence. Because she's not positing anything sort of transcendental. Mm -hmm. And what was the comfort that you said? I'm, I'm curious about that. Is it, is it almost like a comfort like... You're at mom's home and you're just like, oh, I just feel nice and... Um, yeah, and I think it. that uh, through my um, studies, it's just not, through yeah, my undergraduate career of looking at uh, it from stoicism from particular historical framework, mm -hmm. it uh, was almost kind of like a precursor to psychology. It's just answering mm. these questions of how do you deal with yes. profound, just uh, the emotional charges that you just experience as a human being and especially in terms of like sorrow and loss and difficulty and adversity and feeling powerless and how do you entrust that you are part of something greater and larger than yourself. And that's a wonderful point, Jordan, because a lot of this of what we'll delve into, at least book two and three in particular, and even if you want to count book mm -hmm. one into a two, is a lot, for me, practices. Mm -hmm. A lot of the times Marcus Aurelius writes, say to yourself... 
remember dot 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 mm-hmm. it's a lot of little reminders and practices that he can do every day but i think to talk to your point luke about oh well it's great that he says all these things but does he really do it i think what we're getting at or at least what marcus Aurelius is getting at is that it is a struggle and there are some moments where he gets a little hard on himself mm-hmm. and he says what are you doing this isn't this isn't what we why are you this isn't what we wrote about yeah why are you complaining why are you worried about what other people are thinking right now so what we have is a man of action and a man that is struggling and that's something that is an integral part of stoicism just like you said luke it is a philosophy of action and it is drawn to many people who are doers and go through terrible and extreme situations one story i i loved is is of this man named admiral james stocktail and he was shot down over vietnam and he was a prisoner for mm. quite a while and you know, undergo many trials and tribulations. Was this Ross Perot's vice presidential pick, Admiral Stockdale? Admiral James Stockdale? He was, a, he was a philosophy professor at Stanford. Was he? After his time, mm. after his time in the military. Mm, and he was Ross Perot's pick in 1992. Mm. Well, there's, yeah. this, there's this account where he's, he's shot down and he's parachuting out down and and he just knows that what's going to happen to him and he knows that he's going to undergo torture and everything and he mutters to himself as he's going down he says i am leaving the world of technology and entering the world of epictetus in the sense like i'm entering That's i'm so... entering the world of stoicism of oh, marcus aurelius and what's going to be wonderful is that we can understand or at least we're going to understand what that means to Mm -hmm. enter the world of stoicism and that anything that we go through whether i mean we're not going to be shot out of the sky hopefully anytime soon thank goodness no (laughs) no but but (laughs) anything whether whether it be going through traffic or encountering a breakup or going through family troubles we can say i'm leaving the world of where i came and entering the world of marcus aurelius of epictetus of stoicism so i think we should start to at least see what that world comprises of and how we can use it in our daily lives that is not being shot out of the sky, hopefully. So let's start with book one. And to preface that, I think we have to dive into what these books entails because we're not reading, you know, once upon a time I was a philosopher and I did (laughs) this. This is not a regular book at all. What we're dealing with are these little chunks dare i say would you would you call them diary entries jordan or i don't know or just little little notes that he puts in yeah i mean they're almost like i don't know yeah they're just like notes it's yeah. just and that's the thing with uh, i think that the difficulty i think in studying meditations is that it's not necessarily a cohesive work in that no. um so for the most part it's not chapters and and books it's just uh, pretty fragmentary. Mm-hmm. And it's interesting too because at least some of these are short little fragments that you get. Some of them are really, really long and massive. And you would have to think that it's dependent on what he's doing at that time. You know, Perhaps mm-hmm. he had to take a bathroom break and he just jotted something to himself real quickly. And then another time he had a lot of hours on hand and he just wrote by candlelight or whatever light that he had Mm -hmm. at that time so what we're going to be diving into isn't exactly as linear as our previous works we're not Mm -hmm. going to be oh yes he develops this idea further and further but we're going to try to capitalize on certain themes perhaps maybe that would be a little easier yeah i think that maybe a a topical approach might be yeah i think i think the easiest for us and our lovely listeners sure sure that'd be wonderful so let's so let's get right into it then with book one and i i think the the main thing to to talk about with book one is the form i know we're talking thematics and everything but the form of this is is quite fascinating and in it there's a list of certain people and he's and he lists or at least he says what virtues he learned from these people he's not saying oh from my grandfather 
I learned this, you know, trait, or I learned how to be courageous. He's not saying he's courageous per se. He's just saying, oh, well, this is the trait. Like at its best, I learned this from my grandfather. And going back to the idea of as, as a practice, I, I think it's really cool because Marcus Aurelius mentions it in the sixth book, and he says, I quote, whenever you want to cheer yourself. Think of the qualities of your fellows, the energy of one, for example, the decency of another, the generosity of a third, some other merit in a fourth. There is nothing so cheering as the stamp of virtues manifest in the character of colleagues, and the greater collective incidents, the better. So keep them ready to hand. Have we ever heard that before? <laughs> Luke, have you ever listed the, the virtues of your friends or even thought of them at all? Yeah, I mean, I don't know if I think about it so much with my friends. I mean, I do. Or maybe I think just about, people important in your I think life. Of, I, I think of very much so in regards to my parents. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I think uh, I, I like I like to see how my my diff my parents' personalities recombine within me. Like for instance, like um, I like to attribute a lot of my sort of my my drive and my work ethic to my father, mm -hmm. um, and I like to attribute um, my ability for nuance and perhaps abstract ideas to my to my mother now mm -hmm. whether or not that is that is an accurate sort of distribution oh i don't it, think it because matters. but i i tend to think about i'm like well how did i how did how did i become me and i tend to think that those were sort of some of the inheritable qualities that i got from them and that's um, no and that's great that you emphasize that too because marcus aurelius i think for the bigger part of book one spends a lot of time talking about his father or at least his adoptive father which we can go in the context of that later of, okay, well, he was adopted, what? It doesn't really delve into what we're, we're working with here, but it's it's something beyond me. I, I suppose I never really thought of it much of, of saying, okay, what are, the, what are the virtues of my friends or the people that really mattered to me? And I mean, have you done that at all? Jordan, honestly? Maybe I'm totally touchy-feely, yeah. yeah. I mean, for the most part, like, I kind of like tell my friends, like, you're awesome, and here's why. <laughs> um, no, that's great, though. Um, Have you ever wrote it down, though? I guess that's the question. Um, I mean, yeah, like writing cards and mm -hmm. like letters and or even and, just to yourself, notes to friends. Maybe not to myself, but yeah. I would say it's something that I uh, actively reflect on, if not write. Sure, and and that, and that just makes me wonder why it brings about the cheerfulness that he talks about in book six. And granted, I don't know how much into stoicism this practice is, and perhaps you two can enlighten us on that. But to me, it, it, it gives a sort of gratitude and directional purpose, I suppose, to your fellow human beings in some way that is productive and you are fully aware. You're not mindlessly being friends with people. I'm sure... Mm -hmm we have friends, quote unquote friends that we hang out with and we're not really sure why we do. We're not really sure what draws us to that person. We can't really right. say, oh, I really admire Luke's work ethic or something like that. We, we just say, oh, it's just the guy I hang out with and mm -hmm. um, he's funny. And it's something very yeah, vague. I think that kind of speaks to uh, the concept of the, the platonic, like uh, having a virtuous friendship. Mm -hmm. So in my mind, it's kind of this, uh, the concept that oh you know like we're like all three of us are friends because we all have like a close intellectual connection mm -hmm. and that you could like argue is you know a virtuous uh feature you know mm. of our friendship throughout this lecture uh, instead of like instead of being friends of utility you know of oh well i freeload off you guys like i get free <laughs> lunch from you and like rides from you so like i guess we're friends for now <laughs> Well, I think it will become obvious through the course of this seminar series what everybody's strengths are and how they harmonize together in order mm -hmm. to kind of create a more cohesive whole. So it's got, it's kind of interesting. Not only does uh, Marcus Aurelius put it on display in the first book, but we will be putting it on display in our in our seminar discussion of Marcus Aurelius. Um, I've always found, personally, if I just anecdotally oh, record, sure. like I've always found that personal excellence, I think individuals who exhibit personal excellence in uh, whatever field, whether it be in the, the field of uh, musical performance or engineering or um, philosophy or mathematics or whatever uh, whenever I see that on display I think that's been a huge um, inspiration for me mm, oh, in and, regards to virtues yeah, that you... yeah I see so much mediocrity mm. in our world and I think uh, 
if I have anything to be thankful for is that there are a few individuals in my life that actually care about personal excellence. Mm. Um, you don't hear a lot of people talk about that. That's great. And what you just mentioned about mediocrity and everything, Marcus Aurelius does, in a sense, categorize people. He, he, he's, he is a benevolent ruler and he's benevolent towards everyone, but he has a particular drive towards those who as we'll see and dive into what this means, who are in tune with nature and who work within a stoic frame. And he says, those people are the people you should be listening to. And, you know, it's, it's, you know, he, he's, he's usually against trying to go against the masses, but it seems that he's more about, okay, if you are to find somebody just respect those or gain the respect of those that you respect or in a sense that you write about their virtues mm -hmm. about I guess in some way or another yeah it's kind of like the um, you know like surround yourself with like the people who you would like to become yes. you know yeah. and I think that kind of speaks mm. to you know I think something about um, mm. mentorship yeah. and I think that like that's something that we don't really discuss much as a culture and I was having conversations with, like um, with this uh, idea earlier with someone today about mm -hmm. how there's there aren't apprenticeships anymore, mm -hmm. right? So it's you well, know, what I mean? but I mean not I mean internships, but like in the in the full sense like an apprenticeship or like having uh, cultivating a mentorship. It's not something that is like I, I don't think really necessarily openly discussed anymore. Mm -hmm. And that's and that's great. You you mentioned that that the qualities we look for in a person or the people we surround ourselves with and that we admire are the qualities that we want to manifest mm -hmm. and cultivate in some way, which leads me to asking you guys, if you found any qualities within the people that Marcus Aurelius mentions that are worthy of note or whether there is some kind of, there were many, it was, what was interesting yeah, or see yeah, some kind of yeah, way to rein them in that maybe will lead into the second and third book and maybe into yeah. discussing what stoicism is. Yeah. I mean, there were many, I mean, he, I, if you tabulated them all up and I'm sure someone <laughs> has, there are probably like a hundred different virtues or qualities that he admires in different people. Sure. Um, I'm trying to think one of the more notable ones off the top of my head is that someone, I can't remember who mm -hmm. taught him that you could still be raised in a palace but yet have no need for the frivolity that comes mm. with bourgeois life have to have no need for uh festivities and things like that that ultimately you understood the vacuousness of all of that and i think that that was one of the one of the celebrate celebrated qualities that i appreciated from yeah the, from the first book and that's that's almost like a yeah. it, it's a it's you a, can read between some lines yeah. there if you, you like. know it's a it's a <laughs> it's a material sobriety and mm, i would dare say sobriety across all the fields and in, in a lot of the virtues that he extols in these people whether it be a mental sobriety of well this guy he was great socially but he wasn't a hermit and yet he wasn't a crazy you know just guy that tried to when other people had parties and was mm -hmm. rude and everything else that he was a decent human being who was just right down in the center and that he, there's this mental sobriety emotional sobriety material sobriety that he seems to really really admire in people mm -hmm. and that leads into i think a lot of the virtues that he extols and tries to remind himself of in the further books but was there anything that you found a session, yeah Jordan? and uh to note the uh what who luke mentioned i think it was um antonius pius mm. and it kind of reminded me about uh augustine you know like it's not what you have it's how you use it and i kind of mm. like this uh the things that contribute to the comfort of life of which fortune had granted him copious supply he used without ostentation but also without apology mm. so as to enjoy them unaffectedly when they were uh, at hand but to feel no need of them when they were not mm. and I think that kind of uh, speaks to our sort of materialistic consumerist culture doesn't it of when you go on social media and you're like oh I want that Benz want that paper want that money mm -hmm. buy all the things <laughs> yeah it just kind of no, helps keep you like a little bit more level-headed you know yeah no for um, sure i would say i think one of my favorite ones are sort of like i guess instructors you could say is um apollonius mm. 
and uh, who instructs him to uh, sort of remain even keeled in severe pain after uh, losing a child. And I think that this would be a good Ooh. point to note that uh, I think he had 14 or 15 children, um, depending on the sources, and he lost half of his children. So Gosh. seven uh, children did not survive childhood. Wow. So I think that's I think that's why a good reason why Mark Tully's turn to uh, to stoicism yeah. to make sense of such heartbreaking and devastating loss, um, and then another, and then it's so interesting. And then within the, almost like the same turn of phrase, um, he says to uh, this is why he uh, admires Apollonius says, to see clearly from his living example that a person can be extremely energetic yet relaxed. Mm. Because yeah. our, our, I feel like our culture yeah. prides a sort of like frenetic, I work, you know, a 95 hour week. Why? <laughs> yeah. And that, and that so deals... So how can you inject yeah. relaxation um, and a relatively tranquil state of mind to this insane 24 hour pace, globalized, wow, world that we live in that we're just constantly dialed into stuff. And that deals with another, the flip side of of dealing with losses is also mm-hmm. dealing with immense power and responsibility which mm-hmm. that's something I love from uh, well, who was it let's see if I can find it Alexander the Platonist who said rarely and never without essential cause to say or write to anyone that I am too busy nor mm-hmm. to use a similar excuse advancing pressure of circumstances in constant avoidance of the proprieties inherent in our relations to our fellows and contemporaries that he was never too busy or, oh, I, I just, like you said, go, 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 right. that I can never have enough time to talk to a person in need or to help anybody that you're not going to let your power and your responsibility get in the way. And and we see that time and time again with the Marcus Aurelius, even further in this book, too, about trying to be sober in the highest position of any person at that time anyway yeah, yeah, i mean yeah. being the roman emperor and to have a level head and not let the power get to you and to be so insane I mean, yeah and like when you put it in context when, when you think well even a roman emperor had time for his friends what's your <laughs> excuse <laughs> yeah. it helps you contextualize your own life no a it good does deal. <laughs> it does for sure and, and i think it, it, it's quite fitting that he opens with this because I think it contextualizes himself in the world that he's living and it also contextualizes for us what he admires and maybe what he'll focus on in the later scribblings that he'll mm-hmm. have in, in this. But I was wondering if you two had any other comments about book one before we head off into the second book. Yeah, I think I think book one was kind of prologue. I mean, look, I think there's something. I think there you could probably spin, uh, write a whole book about book one. Uh, <laughs> Maybe I try, somebody should try, do that. Yeah, someone probably has. I think trying to go through and really expand upon the life story of each individual. Um, way I would go about it is just sort of getting into the philosophy that's in book two and three, um, mm. because I think it helps to understand why he extols the virtues of those individuals in book uh. one. Um, because uh, there's sort of it's sort of all the different virtues that they have, all the different qualities they have. Are, are rather disconnected unless you understand um, what ultimately gives significance to each individual's life and why and what they contributed to his articulation of stoicism. No, I think so that's great. I think if we can start to work towards Marcus Aurelius's definition of stoicism, we will be greatly served. Sure, and and it's funny. I don't even know if we're going to get a definition <laughs> from this. I know sometimes we're always just okay. Give me, give yeah, me I what stoicism is. <laughs> definition. <laughs> and but the funny thing is, I don't even know if if Marcus Aurelius knows what the definition is necessarily, or that he even. I I I don't know if we can say that Marcus Aurelius is the perfect act of stoicism, or that he knows what he's doing all the time. Because I think when we begin, when the book begins, I mean it's or when book two begins, there's there's a lot of reminders and it's always directed towards that your life, you're, you're going to die soon and mm-hmm. you got to make the most of every day. Almost in the sense that there's a of urgency as if as if he feels like he's not taking full advantage of his own life and that he has to in some way get going. Right, yeah. And I mean, you could also 
frame that uh, in the context of him losing half of his children. Mm. Mm. Of you know, yeah. life was especially precarious. I mean, this is pretty antibiotics, and yeah, I mean, during his reign, uh, there was plague, and then there was famine on top of it. So I'm sure he was just surrounded by death. Mm-hmm. So I'm sure that also put additional pressure on sure. him in addition to the philosophy no. he was reading. And which which, which make these meditations even more charged with with a sense of urgency or a sense of trying to comprehend the world yeah Mm -hmm. because we think of stoicism as this cold thing but i think in book two i mean it's funny i think it's the exact opposite i think it's i think stoicism just provides you with a means to live with the heavily just the, all the emotional charges of your own existence. For sure. I mean, it reminds me of a of a anecdote from from the wife of General George Marshall, who was a really great human being during the time of World War Two, also a general. Mm-hmm. But they said, "Oh man, you know, he's such a selfless and just normal guy. Almost mm-hmm. maybe like a Marcus Aurelius, and you just kind of like." Was he always like that? And then his wife's like, "Hell no, he wasn't. Like he <laughs> suffered with you know. No, he su- no, no, no. I mean, in the sense that like, yeah. I mean, he's just like you guys. He suffered with all of this stuff, right. but mm-hmm. he had to undergo self discipline and modesty and humility in order to try to defend against these things. And I think these meditation, or especially book two, what we'll see is is almost a defense against any kind of whether it be emotional turmoil or becoming superior to anybody else. I mean, I think that's even in the first part or the first, I don't even know if we call them chapters. I don't know how your all's books are, are divided up, but he has a little, there's a little number. They're like, they're like ancient chapters. So yeah. basically just like paragraphs. I, yeah, I ripped mine off the internet. So <laughs> I, have, I, have, I have none of the, the proper pagination. I and will say yeah. when you work in audio and are concerned with getting primary audio, stoicism would be a very effective <laughs> doctrine to eternalize, <laughs> especially when there's so much going on around you that you have no control over. I believe that I am on the cusp of demonstrating perfectly what it's like to be a stoic. <laughs> um, Stoicism in practice. It's happening right, it's right now. now. As, as yeah, I will not have an aneurysm on camera. <laughs> so, oh, no, it's totally, it's yeah. totally fine. Sorry for the, uh, the, the, the noise uh, perturb, uh, perturbations, whatever the word is. Oh, um, no, it's totally fine. But I think getting, getting back to that point about dealing with other people, I mean, even the first, the first little chapter, you know, he's just saying, like, look, I'm going to deal with people that aren't going to be agreeable with what I'm doing. And mm-hmm. I might get yelled at. And I might get pushed around. And But I have to realize that we're all part of this whole. And this whole is something that he's going to go back to time and time again. That we are all a part of this whole. And, and, as, he, and as he says, Nor can I be angry with my kinsman or hate him. We were born for cooperation, like feet, like hands, like eyelids, like the rows of upper and lower teeth. So to work in opposition to one another is against nature, and anger or rejection is opposition. So in some sense that we have to cooperate with one another, regardless if that person cut you off, regardless if that person cheated on you, that there is... A unity that brings us all together and that to try to divide yourself from that unity of saying no I don't belong there but that person's an asshole why, why would I even belong with him right that that brings us together or at least that thought that okay we're all part of the same picture and that I've cut people off mm-hmm. before but you know we're all part of the same thing so I'm going to calm down and not get too angry yeah and I'd like to know uh, the one thing that I thought was uh, an interesting nuance was he makes the distinction that what unites people is mind and the virtue uh, of having like a mind Mm. means that you participate in a portion of the divine but it's not necessarily the blood and guts and sinews of flesh that that unite us so i think that's sort of an interesting nod it almost seemed aristotelian to me saying that we had this sort of ruling center and this mind that separate that enjoins sort of joins us as humans 
but then there's also like almost like a sort of a separation between mind and flesh and what potentially makes this animal. Mm. So I, ha- I have some notes that I'd like to share from this first particular paragraph sure. and things that I thought, thought were, were perplexing in some ways. So the passage that you read about how a sort of every individual is sort of a part of a larger organism. Yeah. Right. Okay. So that Marcus Aurelius is going to be, it seems to be um, implicitly uh, advocating for a view that is organismic. Mm-hmm. Um, an organismic sort of view of the universe that they sort of like this vital living organism and that we're all sort of temporary sort of manifesta- manifestations of it and he'll talk about it later on about how the individual becomes a bit of a cancer um, a tumor he'll u- he'll use that language or something so individuals are if, if the universe is some sort of body your body like I'm your toe and Jordan's your elbow or something like that and it all sort of functions well together um and this, this idea of the universe um, can be traced back to an ancient Greek philosopher named, uh, and, uh, you might have to help me with the pronunciation here, I've butchered, butchered it all day. Um, you want to help Anaxagoras. me? Anaxagoras. Anaxagoras, thank you. <laughs> Anaxagoras, I can't say, I cannot, I cannot say this person's name In for the life sin. of me. I, I do want to note this as we go along, because I think this is very, very interesting. Marcus Aurelius seems to have a shifting conception of the divine. All mm-hmm. right. So he's going to talk about the universe as that which is divine. All right. He's going to talk, and I want to, I hope we get to talk about this to some degree as well. He's going to talk about the ruling part of the person, mm-hmm. which we've already discussed as it's different from the blood and guts. It's different from the breath. It's not the soul that there's going to be this ruling part of the person that it's itself mm-hmm. is divine. Okay, is the divine part that we have or we participate in? It is maybe even our demon, our diamond, which may be traceable. It's like a spirit. It's, yeah, yeah, it might be traceable back to Socrates and yeah, his personal diamond that yeah. that that um, stopped him from doing things that were uh, unwise. Um, so we want to talk about divinity in that respect at some point, and then there's a great allusion to the gods. Mm-hmm. All right. And even God. So I can count at least four ways that the divine is invoked throughout the first, throughout the second and third book of Meditations. And how we reconcile all these views, I think, is going to be very interesting. So you've got the universe is divine, the ruling part of us is divine, the gods, and God. So what's going on here? And that and that and that goes directly with Jordan's point too, where he talks at least in book two about the idea that okay, like you said, we're we're flesh and blood, sure. Okay, and what's breath? Oh, it's just this air that's just going in and out of us. But then there's this directing mind, and that's that's the key, and that connects us with the gods. And, and I think he has a little bit where he says, let me see, let this be enough for you and your mm-hmm. constant doctrine, and give up your thirst for books so that you do not die a grouch, but in true grace and heartfelt gratitude to the gods, that mm-hmm. being a part of this whole is enough for you to be satisfied and content and that we should look to ourselves rather than outside and we should look to trying to understand our role in this universe Mm -hmm. and realize that we're not a tumor it's not a tumor (laughs) but it's it's something that's more than that that we are part of it and that there's nothing that's really bad well that's another thing we'll go into too whether something be good or bad you know thinking makes it so perhaps but but yeah that that is something that we're going to have to dive into more luke and and i wonder if if marcus aurelius was even conscious of of any kind of theology or of how he was trying to map out the divine or anything or in being a man of action i don't know if he was i mean i know he was a philosopher too but Mm -hmm. We know that these were little scribblings, and uh, and that's not to say that they weren't premeditated either. But I don't know. I don't know if we want to put too much onto well, I, it. I'd say this. Look, it probably yeah. wouldn't have have been as paradoxical. I'm just speculating. Here, yeah. Oh, sure. For Marcus that's Aurelius to speak about the divine in such a multiplicity of ways when he's part of an empire that is absorbing religions all over the place, <laughs> yeah. and yeah. can't yeah. get exactly. it straight. Well, like yeah. what it is. is well, I mean, so if he talks about if he talks about God in one way and then in another way, another way, that'd yeah. be perfectly fine. But me coming from it at a Christian perspective, and I'm yeah. here, I'm like, what is it? Are, are we pantheists? Are mm-hmm. we monotheists? Are we polytheists? Are we pantheists? 
like to me that's incredibly problematic because if you're a christian you don't have that stuff right like everything starts to fall apart right i think that you have to keep in mind that there were so many different cults and like especially a really big cult that came from the east in the imperial period was the cult of mithras and it was like a persian cult and it was like the supremacy and redemptive power of like one god so you had this like plurality of beliefs and i think that's what's so hard is for modern readers especially with the judeo-christian mindset going into this Mm. is the fact that these are all valid beliefs and then not to mention that marcus really did not exclusively subscribe from uh, or to stoicism i mean there are elements of cynicism in here and there are elements of epicureanism and Mm. they all kind of had like almost like a sort of a membranous relationship in like they all kind of interact and mm. play off one another. So it's not necessarily like how we would subscribe to like a political view, like I'm a Democrat or like I am a Republican. It's not, they weren't, people didn't dig their heels and say, I am a Stoicism, damn, you know, I'm a Stoic, <laughs> damn it. Or like, I'm an Epicurean, <laughs> damn it, you know? Sure. Um, so I think that if we can allow ourselves to sort of drop our own pretenses and our own, um, I guess, like, conception of the rigidity of constructs then that can help us understand well, do you think there's something problematic about trying to integrate all these different conceptions of the divine because i think he's tr- he, like it, because, i would like, say he has a leaning but i think that to um actually you know i think that's something that we we might have to explore more because i uh, think that i mean he was also a roman emperor like he's not necessarily like a by the book philosopher like he's not like a seneca Mm -hmm. Right. I guess the question is, is like, is it because what I think he's he's giving us enough information here to overcome my initial prejudice that I stated earlier, that stoicism was a vague philosophy that was like that sounded good on paper, but too impractical Mm -hmm. for actual use. He's giving us some ideas here. I mean, I think it's very fascinating to talk about the universe in terms of an organism. I think it's very fascinating to talk about the God within. I think it's very fascinating to talk about all these different conceptions of the divine. And I think you can actually extrapolate and come up with more of a metaphysical structure from this. And maybe that's something we'll see in further installments. But if, if that all of that is sort of extraneous and superfluous to the pragmatic import of practicing Stoicism, um, if they're separable in some way, like is that just stuff that we have to sort of push through in order to get to the applied lessons? Mm-hmm. Or, or do we take the essential from that like maybe maybe not we're we're moving across but maybe we are dare i say appropriating what what this idea of being a part of a whole means to a stoic philosopher like marcus Aurelius. what does that mean to be a part of a whole well he talks a little bit about about it in the Mm -hmm. next paragraph which about providence and and Mm -hmm. chance and so maybe that will be an illuminating thing to discuss if i i I don't want to take too much control. Oh, no, no, no. But it we, seems we like... We are all together. Yeah, it's, it's, it's we're all like, part of a whole here. <laughs> it seems like we're running up against that. So. Sure, because I think that goes into this idea of of good and bad in the world. And that since we are part of this whole... And there's this interesting point where Marcus Aurelius says, well, he he debates whether, you know, is if gods exist okay you know there's this but if the gods don't exist well eh, well, but i can tell you that the gods do exist and and as i quote and they have put it absolutely in man's power to avoid fail falling into the true kind of harm if there were anything harmful in the rest of experience they would not well, they would have provided for that too to make it in everyone's power to avoid falling into it and if something cannot make a human being worse how could it make his life a worse life in the sense that, and to go further, he says, all these things come to good and bad alike, but they are not in themselves either right or wrong. Neither then are they inherently good or evil, because they are part of the whole that the divine God, the gods, have provided mm-hmm. us. And that to try to divorce ourselves from that and say, why have you done this to me? implies some sort of, I don't even want to say disobedience, but I, I love the analogy that Marcus Aurelius will use later as the tumor, that if we separate ourselves from that, from the will of the gods, from the will of the whole in general, then everything's going to seem like some kind of 
backstabbing or betrayal but if we look at it all as part of some whole and 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 purpose then we can in some way tell ourselves and maybe maybe this is the practical part of it that everything and again it's one of those adages that people keep saying but everything happens for a reason Mm -hmm. and that it isn't a bad thing that happened it's just something that had to happen and i have to like marcus aurelius says you know learn some further good lesson and then stop your bitching and complaining (laughs) yeah in some way yeah i think what's interesting about this is um is that you're, you're talking about how bad and good have no real signification because ultimately from a larger perspective they actually may sure. serve the whole of the universe or providence yeah so what this automatically is going to mean i believe is that really there is nothing but providence and chance is an yeah. illusion all right and that means that necessity is going to drive everything so then one has to ask the question where is their choice for marcus aurelius in the schematization right. of him. And it seems like really the only choice is the one's attitudinal approach to the particular circumstance that they find themselves well, in. Well, I think now, it's that, but also you have to think about the aspect of like living, his emphasis on living in accordance with nature. So mm. my question would be, is nature what providence like designs? Mm-hmm. So is it one, one of those things that you, in an ethical framework, ought to comport yourself in a way that acts towards like sort of finding some sort of um i guess like i'm, I'm thinking like in a directional way sort mm-hmm. of like if you act in a way that's like that the, i don't know that the universe like or providence like designs for, for you. you yeah mm-hmm. and i wonder yeah. too if it's if it's a mixture of doing as much as you can and then as we keep saying god willing mm-hmm. or i've done everything and now it's now it's in the hands of the gods mm-hmm. where you realize that there are some things that you cannot control and that you can do like you said right. as much as you can and as luke said whether it be directing your mind to the external and looking at it in a different way or like you said of trying to do the most that you can which puts control back in your hands and earlier in book 1 he mentions uh he thanks someone for basically uh, dissuading him from becoming obsessed with incantations and spells and mm. magic but fortune was very much bound up in that and a lot of sort of like magical practices and amulets was like an apotropaic um, a- attempt to sort of ward off these evil spirits um, like mm-hmm. f- uh, Fortuna was basically personified as this like potentially uh, benevolent or malevolent force like if you were um, either too wealthy or too successful that could potentially attract the forces of um, invidia or envy and just like wipe out your crops, wipe mm. out your stored wealth, take your family away from you. So I think that shifting Fortuna to the mindset of Providence, I think that takes that uh, random chaotic element away from Fortuna and transfers that power back onto yourself. Like it is within my power to like fix the situation um, or uh, you know, uh, or interpret sheep, the situation. Yeah, like yeah. my sheep were taken from me because I didn't honor the gods in the correct way. Versus, I don't know, you know, just some <laughs> disease. Yeah, that reminds me. Of, my that reminds me of a great little story about this about this guy, and and I'm not going to say the whole story, but his horses ran away, mm-hmm. and, and his and, and all the townspeople say, "Oh, your horses all ran mm-hmm. away. That's so terrible." And he says, "We'll see." And then all the horses came back and more. Yeah. And thousands of horses came back and they're like, yeah. you must be so happy. And he's like, we'll see. And then and then the horse, one of the horses breaks his son's leg and they're like, oh my goodness, that must be so terrible. And what do you think he says? Huh? We'll see. And then yeah. all the young sons have to go off to war and his son stays home. And they're like, you must be so happy. Your son doesn't have to go to war and die. And he's like, we'll see. And I don't know if that can, <laughs> that, yeah. that's the story. But I mean, but it's like, yeah, it's taking whatever you have and just saying, well, this is great, you know, this is just the way it is, you know, and we'll see what happens. I'm not going to, like you said, maybe get too, oh my goodness, like, I want to keep all of this, mm-hmm. or to, you know, I don't deserve this, but right. just soberly just taking it and Almost saying... Almost accepting you know, your lot, yeah, <laughs> in a way. Yeah, and maybe that's what Marcus Aurelius is, is trying to tell us, is to accept our lot as part of this greater whole, mm-hmm. and that any time that we do go against that we 
we are unhappy and that we are dissatisfied or mm -hmm. we're angry or we're right. upset and mm -hmm. that Marcus really just gives us that tool to use and say okay well tell me do you feel like you're like the world's against you and if you're like yeah man I just feel like everything's just ha bad happening and maybe he would say at least from the second book oh well it's probably because you think that you're divorced from the world and to and to use the um, 16th quote unquote chapter of this he says the soul of a man harms itself first and foremost when it becomes a separate growth a sort of tumor on the universe because to resent anything that happens is to separate oneself in revolt from nature and then he goes on with different ways that we do that and he said and one way is when it turns away from another human being or is even carried so far in opposition as to intend harm road wage anybody mm -hmm. and another is the soul harms itself thirdly when it gives into pleasure or pain which we all do on a day-to-day -day basis at least i know i do and he goes gives goes on and on but there is this idea that he's trying to get i think and what at least i've gotten for book two is that we have to realize that we're not all just against or i guess like i like he mm -hmm. like how he uses revolt from nature that we all can say oh why me why is everything so terrible you know oh everybody's out to get me or that person tina's such an asshole or whoever mm -hmm. anybody yeah. tina karina who cares but that we have to realize that we're all part of this whole and and i, I don't know it may just and sober even, up in yeah some way. and he even ties like civic identity into it in that passage that you just read saying mm -hmm. that like it, it's the end for all rational creatures to partake in the the laws and the institutions mm. of of cities and that kind of reminds me of you know the aristotelian notion uh the, you know man who dwells outside the the polis is either a man or be or sorry a god or beast like that's mm. that this is where like people belong is in like a civic structure that's beautiful all right guys can i take a can i take the reins for a second yeah go ahead uh, i think we've uh, kind of galloped ahead a little bit i want to go over some of the details that perhaps occurred in between all that oh sure um so some of the things i want to talk about here are that um we've talked a little bit about this providence being in tune with nature i think we need to get more definite about what that means mm -hmm. um I think we have not spoken enough about the ruling aspect of the self and what that actually means to have some sort of harmony with the universe or something like that. He obviously thinks that there's some sort of divine aspect going on there. So like what, when we talk about being um, in accordance with nature, it's not like we're just going out and meditating <laughs> underneath a tree and like going, om, 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 I'm in, I'm in tune with nature. It's none of that nonsense. It's not like shopping at Whole no, Foods. <laughs> no, what it's going to mean, <laughs> or, it's delicious, what, it's gonna, what, what it's going to mean is that, that it's going to be, that you're going to be driven by right reason, okay? And by mm -hmm. right reason, we're going to see a number of virtues come to the surface. Specifically, he'll enumerate them at various points. Yeah. Justice, fortitude, temperance, and truth. Those are going to be things that right reason drives. And we need to keep that as a focus. It's a very Augustinian notion. Yes, I was going to say, like as I was encountering that, I hope Jordan picks up on that because we we saw the glory of the virtues in our conversation yeah. about on free choice of the will in Augustine um, that presumably he would pick up from Marcus Aurelius mm -hmm. and Plato and stuff like that. So you can trace uh, the precursor and the successor for this. And you Wonderful. and and yeah. so long as you're focused on right reason, you're not going to have you're not going to be buoyed around in existence. You're not going to be have all these sort of external things, whether it be pleasures or pain or or unnecessary bus busyness, because you're going to be fixated on making sure that you're um, right. you're doing reason correctly. Something else that I thought was pretty interesting um, uh, that we that we that we didn't address, I thought was cool was um, he takes the time to say that, and this is another reference to Augustine. Mm -hmm. the, the 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 is it the lifespan no this oh. is the um this is how he talks about our motivations in regards to pleasure and anger mm -hmm. all right? right he also yeah. he thinks that there is something worse about being overwhelmed by pleasure because that shows a certain sort of passivity a lack of development of that right reason unlike mm -hmm. with anger where perhaps something from the outside external, has, yeah. something from external has provoked one into anger whereas pleasure shows a weakness of spirit to begin with you're a dumb animal and it can be overcome by simple pleasures whereas anger maybe could be could be attributable to somebody, somebody else the interesting thing about that is you can be much more destructive with anger than pleasure but yet because the metric for everything for Marcus Aurelius is going to be the ruling part that divinity that diamond 
and those intelligible pr principles that are within and also part of the fabric of the universe, that is going to be the determination for what makes things good and bad. We need to talk about death to some degree here. Yeah, that's true. Um, we definitely do. Uh, <clears throat> uh, CJ hinted at it all right, all, already about whether or not um, we need to fear death. Yeah. Um, I think what CJ has... Uh, as CJ, I think, quite, very eloquently said, he was talking about how the gods have given us, or God, the universe, or God, whatever you want to talk about, maybe these are all sort of just interchangeable names, have given us reasons so that we can practically live a good life that will bestow sim simpleness and contentedness and peace of mind here by using reason. And we don't mm -hmm. really need to worry about if, if, if there is an afterlife or if there are gods or whatever, then like they're going to give us the mechanism to thrive and be successful there. They've done it here in the temporal realm. Why shouldn't we think that it's going to happen there? Yeah, and that it's part of the whole. I mean, he even says, you know, well, I guess, uh, let me see. What is death? Someone looking at death per se and applying the analytical power of his mind to divest death of its associated images. So again, using that, using your reason, using your, your noodle, We'll conclude then that it is nothing more than a function of nature. And if anyone is frightened of a function of nature, he is a mere child. And death is not only a function of nature, but also to her benefit. So, yeah, yeah. yeah, and there's also a point I'd like to make that he says that all these things sort of in, in nature, substance, like matter, this is reminding me, uh, it evoked the Epicurean mindset, mm -hmm. um, is that sort of like the constant ebb and flow and like the sort of like compilation of matter and its disintegration. But everything is cyclical. Mm. So everything in all eternity recurs in cycles. And then um, on the What same... does that mean? Why don't you elaborate a little? He'll talk about that in book three. Oh, uh, yeah, bit. sure. I mean, I'll just kind of read the, the direct quotation that I had in mind. Uh, so always bear in mind these two points. Firstly, that all things are alike in nature from all eternity and recur in cycles. So it seems to me that there's one sort of point of origin that everything comes from and everything happens in a cyclical nature. So why are you stressing out about death if you are just going to partake in the cycle in some form or another? And then uh, the this... elements of ourselves will dissolve right, and the then be, and then reconstitute themselves in other Precisely. elements. Precisely. So exactly. So it's just we're matter, we decay, and like we are reformed at some point in a sort of cyclical element. And then second point, um, this really was um, very um, evocative of Augustine about light, like a lifespan, and he says, uh, uh, the longest lived and the earliest to die suffer an equal loss. Mm. Why? Um, so oh, why, see, yeah. so, so, why, for, yeah. so why, why is it important to talk, because this is pretty interesting, and I thought mm -hmm. perplexing about this text too, uh, I, I, I have to find where it is exactly, I wish we all I had I think it's because we edition. don't have a, like we never fully have a grasp on like the past or the future. Precisely. All we have is that present moment. So if you only have like, it's hard to like sort of um, quantify oh how many present moments you have you only <laughs> I got a couple <laughs> you, the three of us sitting more. right here all have we have no past yeah. and we have no future it is not guaranteed to us none of that is ours all we have right now is this present moment right. and it's not like you can amass more present right that's exactly all, that's all it is and so and in the present is gone just like that so like whether or so not it's a fleeting moment that everyone participates in so what's the difference in terms of like an aggregate of like fleeting moments what like what does it matter and i think that i think that goes to the optimism of stoicism like you mentioned in, in the beginning too because he also says it is only the present moment of which either stands to be deprived and if indeed this is all he has he cannot lose what he does not have in mm -hmm. a sense that we can't lose what we already did you know our past we can't lose something that we had and we right. can't lose something that we're we've never had but we're anticipating so this going back and forth maybe and you're looking back at a relationship and saying oh i wish i had that again or mm -hmm. looking forward and say oh my gosh you know i that, that girl looks really attractive mm -hmm. or something that you shouldn't you shouldn't get your mind wrapped up in that because all you have is now and that you can't get right. your panties in a bunch about mm -hmm. The, you know going forward or what's behind you because it's not that's not there it's, well, it's, it's very just you know. it's just ephemera yeah like you can't the only sort of like quasi tangible thing you have is the present and even that yeah. is just is gone so like mm -hmm. again like what's the point in stressing out about it <laughs> oh and that's that's what he tells himself time and time again i, I say, he's almost like his own uh 
drill sergeant was just like, why are you mm-hmm. getting so upset about what you, <laughs> about these people that are right. messing and with think, your life? You're like, yeah, focus I, on now, damn it. I think that's also him when he writes those things. I think it's, he's writing a lot of things that he wants to actualize. Yes. He might not be at mm. that state, but that might mm. be the desired point that he wants to be at. That's so great because philosophy, how many times do we like think a philosophical the guy board, has it? You know yeah, I mean? where we think, yeah, exactly. Like a goal board or something. <laughs> so like a Pinterest, you're like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, Pinterest not board. all the people have done all those things but it's something that you you know just maybe want to do but i mean how many times do we i mean maybe philosophy has this air of oh they got to figure it out therefore they're going to write this text about such and such philosophy working out the majority of the stuff he's going through like with the guidance of philosophy sure and i mean that goes back to socrates or even kierkegaard too Mm -hmm. where it's this idea is like i'm not really smart but we're gonna I'm not you know perfect, like yeah but... i'm not perfect but we're gonna talk about this you mm-hmm. know and yeah that's really great yeah it is i uh so what do you guys make of this talk about how when one actualizes their right reason they're in some way coming closer to the deity what did you think of that mm, i think it makes i think it makes sense though because if you, if you if we go back to our idea about the whole if you realize that everything that happens to you is a part of that whole then i mean i forget it's not a problem oh sorry go ahead oh you're good oh yeah i was just thinking um with i i don't think it's in book two might be in book three about how he says that the sort of the best people are the ones who serve the gods because everything Mm. that is good comes from the gods so if we deem our intellect and our rational capacity to be a good thing by extension that would have to come from the gods. That's great you mentioned So, yeah. I, So Marcus Aurelius in 13 extols that our highest purpose or calling is to become uh, servants and to hold, uh, quote, to hold fast to the guardian spirit uh-huh. and to, quote, serve it single-mindedly. And, to, and so yeah. you're supposed to, in this service, you're supposed to just strip it of passion and uh, just, you know, impulsive behavior and dissatisfaction that comes from, like, uh, just the whole mess of gods and human beings and all that. I like how your translation has, I believe your translation has translated diamond to guardian spirit. Yeah. And so do you, now when I read this, it seemed like to me that I could associate rationality, diamond, and intelligible principles with all together. I mean, is that is that the way to understand it? I mean, are, do you, is, is, is Marcus Aurelius's diamond his his rationality? Is that the ruling tend, part of him? I think so. That's actually a good question because I tend to conflate the two, but there could be nuances to it that I might not be able to fully. Rest. Well, I, I think I'm conflating them as well. What I'm saying is yeah. that it looks like his intelligence and his rationality as his diamond are, are are all the same. Right. And then it seems like in the in the exercise of it, mm-hmm. there are certain sort of, it, it plays itself out in certain sort of civic virtues where people are interested in the common right. good, um, where you develop personal fortitude and temperance and all these other virtues, that there's a certain sort of ecstasy that is the result of that, that there is no finer pleasure. There, if you guys recall right. the, ple- the part where he talks about, if a man are to find something greater than justice and truth and all this other mm-hmm. stuff, then go seek it. But he's confident, right. what, that they won't it's find the it. Good. That this that that this is the highest good, that this mm-hmm. practicing right reason is all and, and putting it into implementation, it it's it seems like either it's getting some sort of fulfillment in the process that's producing a contented life, mm-hmm. or by drawing closer to God, the universe, the gods, the proximity one gets happier. How did you guys understand that? I mean, I, I tend to see it as the, the proximity to the gods, but then I also could be associating that with, like, imperial cults, too. Um, but e- mm, I'm not really quite sure. I'm still sort of teasing that out for myself. Okay. Well, I, I mean... I can see it as kind of, like, a process, but then I can also see it just as, like, a participation. Well, it could go either way, right? Like, in right. the sense that, like, he doesn't really know. He leaves it an open question yeah. about whether or not mm-hmm. there are actually gods. So, like, if there are no gods, then it's just a self-fulfilling process. Right. If there are gods, it's a self-fulfilling process, and you're closer to God, and therefore <laughs> somehow you get to participate in the glow of that divine universe or that divine intelligence that you're right. approximating. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, I think it's an important point to point out. Yeah. Um, 
Do we want to dive into book three? Uh, no. <laughs> like, not yet. Not yet. Let not me yet. Perfect. Yeah. yeah. No. See if let me, let me see else. if there's... there's a lot. There's a lot to take in. Oh, uh, we talked about text. we talked about how they're. So the thing that was uh, to to touch back on this idea how every individual has a present, mm-hmm. and that ultimately it makes no difference if you live a hundred years, a two hundred right. years, a thousand years. There's there's no future. There's no past. You only have this present. And he'll go on and he'll talk about how like everyone eventually sees enough to know what it's like to live so it doesn't really matter if you got 100 years or 200 years under your belt Mm -hmm. what matters if you sort of get organized in the right way or where you're disciplined in such a way that right reason um is supreme Mm -hmm. um is that true is that true i mean i guess what i'm trying to say here is like presumably my present it would seem like to me my present would matter less than say a child's present Right, a child's present, like if a child is killed, they don't just sort of like get re. Uh, I, I guess there's something significantly more tragic about that because they didn't have really a time to have this ruling part come into existence. But I don't not sure of... everybody's presence is the same. I actually think that a child's might be more valuable. I think that you're kind of like a little bit under the influence of like the like kind of like with like Simone, right? That like having that potentiality to disclose your being and having that cut off but if we're looking at in terms of strictly time of just the present it's for me it's hard to equate the the present my present being different from a child's present yeah i mean i guess i guess the question would be is like does marcus aurelius have a mechanism where everything is made all right in the end Mm-hmm. Like if everything is like ultimately reabsorbed into the universe, what does it really like matter? Yeah, if it's mm-hmm. if it's ultimately, let's say there's like let's say the universe is completely a materialistic organism for a Stoic, right? Mm-hmm. And, and by material, I, I don't mean like there's any sort of divinity to it. I mean it's just like I think that's more of an Epicurean lens, though. I don't know, but what I'm trying to say, yeah. if it is that, um, then it's no big deal because we're all just sort of life processes in this thing. Mm-hmm. But if it is something greater, does that change it at all? Like if it is some sort of divine body, mm-hmm. does that really change it at all? Or do we just get like reabsorbed into that body and like put out to do work somewhere else? Uh, I, I got, you know, does, does, does that change the value of the present for anything? Mm-hmm. Ultimately, right. it seems so like the, the individual present, doesn't matter on any of right. this. Right. So if the present has like no bearing or consequence, oh, if, like so. I mean, if we think of province as kind of like this cosmic eraser, like if what I do in each present moment doesn't really matter because providence will just somehow like magically fix everything. Is that what you're asking? If like the present doesn't have as much importance or bearing because providence will just fix everything. I guess if providence is such a thing that like you have these if you if providence is such a thing that really all that really matters is sort of the arc of the universe or whatever then it, you can say that it doesn't the individual present moments don't matter because ultimately the only thing that matters is the universe like so if a child dies or i die uh, at 36 and he dies at 6 it doesn't it's all the same we're all going to be sort of reabsorbed back into this entity Right. Whether it be divine or material, I'm not even sure what the difference is anymore. Mm-hmm. The the individual seems to have like no real role in stoicism, and I think for the reason why I was like, no, we can't progress. We, this because this is especially problematic for someone like me who does so much work on the individual and Christian existentialism. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a, it's it, it's a tough pill to swallow. To just be like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It doesn't really matter if you live X years or Y years or Z years. Mm-hmm. Like, well, actually, you know what, like. Maybe yeah, it, does. It, it really does. It really, it, it really does. But if the ultimate consequence is just reabsorption, and there's no like hell or heaven or purgatory or anything like that, then maybe yeah. there's absolutely yeah. No and to point to uh, chapter two, uh, whatever it is that I am is flesh and a bit of breath and ruling center. So that reminds me of I want to say it was Epictetus. Um, I'll have to double check, but the so to paraphrase, you know, we're but just little um, corpses carrying around a soul. Mm. Uh, is that? It, it, I mean, it just doesn't really seem like the uh, our lives are like 
like sort of that important in like the grand yeah and i wonder i wonder if that's a way to defend oneself from grandiosity or some kind of larger than life view because we're talking about the emperor somebody that was worshipped as some sort Mm -hmm. of god in and of himself and that maybe this thought process is a is a way just to say look I'm flesh and blood. You know, this this philosophy is in some way, or what we're discussing is some memento mori of just saying, like, mm-hmm. look, whether I'm a baby child or an emperor that I am right now, I am going to be absorbed yeah, and erased by totally. the the gods' magic eraser or something like that. Yeah, and it reminds me also of Heraclitus. Um, paraphrasing also i shall i'll double check on this and get back to you guys next series um but you know uh with heraclitus um sort of like left life is nothing but a, a breath and shadow mm. oh. i will have to say though the thing that we we will learn in book three is that there is actually a tripartite const- uh, construction of the person mm-hmm. for marcus aurelius right. so there, there's going to be body soul and then there is going to be uh, something else. There's going to be these intelligible principles. Uh, the body is going to be stream. The soul is going to be a vapor. Um, and then there's going to be these principles that rule the soul. There's a particularly eloquent passage that I, I found from that. Mm-hmm. Um, but we'll get to that in 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 book three. Um, I think we've covered the last thing. And CJ, since CJ intimated this, and I just wanted to elaborate on it because I think it, it's important about the whole talk about how we make a t- ourselves a tumor yeah. upon the universe um you know you, t- you talked about how um if we are at odds with other men that somehow like this is going to be this is what's going to vex us and make a tumor and i think i mean that would be sort of the precise sort of definition right is that we're not sort of performing our function within the world mm-hmm. if um we're antagonizing something else that's that's in that grand schematization. Mm -hmm. So that, that, that sort of made sense. But I I think there were at least five other or four other ways that we could make ourselves a tumor. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah, there were. uh, The second one was the soul becomes a tumor if it injures another man via anger. Um, Oh, I said that already that that there's, there's separation antagonism. I think it's a little bit of an echo of the first, um, uh, the third is to be overpowered, overpowered by pleasure or pain. Um, I believe in that instance, then you're not having the, the ruling part of you properly instilled. You're given away to something that's more bestial. Uh, the fourth is uh, when we act authentically. Why, uh, and I guess you have to ask yourselves why this would make the soul a cancer. Um, if, that's, if we're acting inauthentically, I guess we sort of have ourselves divest into multiplicity. We're not necessarily acting yeah. on that right reason. Um, that makes sense. I, uh, yeah, and then the other thing, and I thought this, I thought this language was very curious, and maybe Jordan can lend some perspective to it, mm-hmm. given her background, is that um, Marcus Aurelius is inclined to speak of our participation in reason as being a part of some sort of ancient polity, right. some highest polity. So it's not we can't be aimless. We are going to be a chance a cancerous tumor if we are aimless, if we don't have some end that sort of drives all our existence. And we have to understand where we fit into the universe. And ultimately it seems like everything's got to be made in accord with reason and justice and truth and fortitude and temperance. But the question, like what I think is is super interesting is that he talks about like, if we don't do that, we're not going to be part of this most ancient polity what is that? Like, what is he talking about? I mean, I think the thing is, is that one of the reasons why I love the classics mm-hmm. is because you <laughs> never really get to the heart of a text until... This is all Greek, so I haven't, I haven't looked at Greek in, like, years. Um, so it depends on the liberty of the translation. So um, could you... Oh, I guess you don't have the, uh, the correct pages. So my text says um, the law of the most venerable... Um, Sorry, the like law of the most venerable of cities and constitution. So mine says venerable, but yours might mean something ancient. something to that effect. So, but so, but there, I mean, there are nuances, but those are important distinctions. So there's sometimes where uh, the comprehension of a text can um, go one way or the other, and it's highly dependent on the translation. So, what do you think he's referring to as far as some sort of polity? Um, honestly, I'd I'd have to like 
look at the text itself. Like, it almost makes me think that he thinks that there's, like, another well, realm. Well, you could that think of it in terms of, you know, like, a microcosm or, a, or in, this, <laughs> in, like, this case, it would be, like, the cosmos or, like, a macrocosm. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Right? Because if you think of, like, it might just be an easier way for Marx Aurelius to convey um, or, you know, really conjure a, a metaphor you know of like the the universe yeah. as just a a well-ordered upright yeah. polis kind of yeah. like you know like i don't know like the <laughs> kind of like the republic yeah that makes sense yeah maybe it's like maybe it's a hypothetical abstraction in order for us to sort of go about ordering our business here yeah so the yeah, maybe it doesn't really have an existence apart mm-hmm. from one's imagination but it, it seemed very strange of him to talk about there being this this yeah. highest ancient polity, it it seems like he's talking about something in the past. But I mean, I guess if he's if it's more like a Kantian kingdom of ends, I can get more behind it. But it seems like yeah, he has some sort of, of creation sense. myth in mind. Uh, I don't, I don't really think so. Well, it was strange language, either way. <laughs> I, I mean, the the problem is that this is rendered from Greek, and I don't think that. Um, I mean, because he mentions studying rhetoric, a lot of rhetoric, and a lot of oration um greek was the sort of um cosmopolitan like i guess you could say like fancy language of like the ancient world um like as we would think oh like oh she speaks latin she's so sophisticated (laughs) like that's how the romans viewed greek Mm. um but uh, yeah so a lot of it is depending on uh dependent on uh translation in in greek and unpacking the greek and stuff like that and well, maybe yeah. a more maybe a more stable conception of what these things will uh, are will emerge over the course of covering yeah um was it we've had 12 books or something like that something like that yeah something and i like think that. that's great that you mentioned you know that, that greek is sort of this language for them that was this mysterious sort of Lang- or maybe like a it was like, the, unquote, it was like yeah. the lingua franca um mm-hmm. so it was really it was just i mean obviously like ubiquitous throughout the empire mm-hmm. but it was also seen as like the more sophisticated language mm. and not um, not many yeah. you would i would assume then that maybe not many or maybe a couple people would be able to at least in marcus aurelius's circle would be able to comprehend it maybe oh yeah easily easily comprehend it but it's um one function of comprehension and another to render it very elegantly uh, sure so, and we're assuming that he and has a, yeah and i'm sure he has but he's also at the same time cannot stress this enough he's a soldier and an emperor mm-hmm. and a politician so you know cicero i'm sure had a beautiful command of of greek um but you know maybe with marcus aurelius that wasn't as big of uh, a concern for him because he even says you know in book uh, one thanks for steering me away from the poetic flowery mm. language with, with like sophistry, sprinkled yeah. with adornment and sophistry correct yeah no that makes sense but it, it almost to me makes it seem like a more personal text if he's writing in a language that maybe many wouldn't be able to understand and was like a, a secret even if he's not necessarily trying to mm. yeah be philosophy all uh, philosophy was mostly like written in greek but um mm. you know it could have also been a way to sort of you know encode in himself I'm, i mean i'm sure like there are if, if there are any <laughs> linguists or anyone who studies um ancient greek they are just crying out right now oh. um so these are just my mere conjectures <laughs> oh, no that's fine no no and they can cry out to us at another time if they'd like and help us out but i we really di- divested so much time into in both of these books and i think we really got a good grasp and these are very in-depth look at it do we want to save book three perhaps for another time or maybe for the next episode i think it would be a good breaking point here because for the audience mm-hmm. i think it might be a lot because i think by it the time is we a lot to take. it's more for me to take it yeah, yeah. i was like whoa there's so much more to this than i thought I, I i think we can easily do another installment here in about a half hour 40 minutes sure um, uh but maybe for the audience we should break it up into another episode yeah, no problem sure, thank so, you all for listening hope you enjoy installment two yeah right. thanks everyone bye, bye.